speakers, uh, David Hirsch and Dan Van Hampton, uh, who have known each other a little while, they met in first grade. So they've been around. Uh, they'll talk about how geometry and Abraham Lincoln's speeches are related, what is the real importance of the Cooper, Cooper Union speech, and they will address the connection between that speech and, uh, no, excuse me, between Abraham Lincoln and Thomas Jefferson through the Declaration of Independence. Uh, both speakers have advanced degrees. One is a PhD in double E electrical engineering, and the other has a Juris Doctorate degree, so he's an attorney. Uh, together they have written uh, that, Abraham Lincoln and the Structure of Reason, and they're going to talk to us tonight about that. Yeah, thank you. Your phones. <laughs> this one doesn't work. And, uh, you got yours going. Oh. Push up. Push up. I think I don't know. He's, he's the electrical engineer. Yeah. We, we, we tested all the technology, but we didn't test the microphones. This is the technology we tested. Okay, yes. Okay. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to speak uh, to this historic Civil War roundtable at this most historic location. Uh, thanks also to our publisher, Savas Beatty, who helped coordinate the arrangements uh, for this evening's talk. Also, we'll be having books uh, if we finish before midnight <laughs> <laughs> that uh, are available. You see, I was very smart. I got him to coordinate the slides. <laughs> okay, so a nice quotation about fine wine. Our presentation is easier to understand if you set aside what you already know about rhetoric, logic, facts, reasoning, argument, persuasion, and demonstration. <laughs> and actually, uh, we're serious about that because um, if you clear your mind, uh, you, you have a chance to understand just how clear and focused the minds of Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln were. Fine wine tastes best when poured into a clean and empty glass. Now this is the most important slide with the possible exception of one other uh, in the whole presentation. Are you satisfied with today's public discourse. No. no. Why? It's not civil. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right on the nose. In 1938, Stuart Chase wrote in The Tyranny of Words, I've written several books and many articles, but only lately have I begun to inquire into the na nature of the tools I use. This is a curious oversight when one stops to consider it. Carpenters, masons, and engineers who give no thought to their tools and instruments are not likely to erect very durable structures. Stuart Chase described communication disconnects but stopped short of a specific solution. He, with great foresight, discussed Euclid and plane geometry. He saw Euclid's geometric substance, 
but did not see Euclid's method, the six elements. The substance, of course, is ge geometry, plain geometry. Chase understood Euclid's geometry and its mathematical limitations. He did not see the six elements and the elements' unlimited structural power as vessels for words. Chase's eyes were on the bark of the tree. The forest was invisible. Chase missed Euclid's linguistic use of the scientific method. Near the end of his almost 400-page book, Chase keenly reasoned, we desperately need a language structure for the clear communication of observations, deductions, and ideas concerning the environment in which we live today. After a list and discussion of communication breakdowns, Chase articulated a, an appealing general solution. The age-old disagreements in these studies relating to language disconnects will continue until uh, the Englishman, uh, as, landed, uh, as Lancelot Hogben, Hogben, the English author of uh, Mathematics for the Millions. How many of you have heard of that book? Um, Dan and me. I bought it in paperback and it's really thick uh, for 45 cents, so that tells you. <laughs> uh, do we realize that the future, human, uh, the future of human reason lies with those who are prepared to face the task of rationally planning instruments of communication using science as part of that language. So what is civil discourse? And I think uh, the person who answered civility, if you had to summarize rational human discourse, if you don't have civility, you've got nothing. Uh, the only thing more important might be um, uh, facts, truthful facts, credibility, and scientific reasoning. But today's discourse generally starts with a conclusion and uh, if there's only one head talking, it, it degenerates in, immediately into a bunch of argument and if there's more than one head talking, you can't distinguish who's saying what words because they're all talking at the same time uh, with the same kind of babble. So, Abraham Lincoln, after a two-year term in Congress, Abraham Lincoln considered himself to be a failure as a politician, and he wanted to become a better attorney and a better speaker. So from 1849 to 1854, he burned the midnight oil studying Euclid's elements. And Euclid's elements, of course, contain 173 propositions and are the foundation of what we know today as plain geometry. And uh, so during those five years, from 1849 to 1854, uh, after his congressional term, Lincoln learned the six elements of a Euclidean proposition. So these are the six elements, the enunciation, exposition, specification, construction, proof, and conclusion. The first element, the enunciation, has a uh, two parts, a given and a sought. The elements shown in brown are factual related. The elements shown in green, the sought specification and conclusion, have a logical progression. And we'll see more what that means as we go through the, the uh, and talk about the definitions. And of course, the fifth element is the proof. So David and I took 10th grade geometry together and we had a textbook called Science, from the Science Math Study Group at the University of Illinois. Does anyone here, did anyone here take SMSG geometry? I thought I saw a hand in the back. I've actually, I've actually had audiences where people jumped up and said, I remember that. <laughs> well, in our 10th uh, grade geometry book, there's a quotation that, that struck us. We have said that theorems are going to pro be proved by logical reasoning. We have not explained what logical reasoning is, and in fact, we don't know how to explain this in advance. As the course proceeds, you'll get a better and better idea of what logical reasoning is by seeing it used, and best of all, by using it yourself. This is the way all mathematicians have learned to tell what is a proof and what isn't. 
So, uh, let's move on to the, the, wor the world of law. In a 1964 U.S. Supreme Court uh, decision, uh, Potter Stewart cleverly fashioned a defective definition of pornography. I know it when I see it, okay? So a soundbite, no matter how clever, is not a demonstration. The six elements define a demonstration. They are what they, are what they say. Definition enables repeatability. The elements of a proposition are a scientific method that can be used with civility for fact-based, logical, reasoned discussion of human problems. Now, there have been 16,000 books about Abraham Lincoln. Many of them discuss his writings, and they talk about how beautiful they are, how, how logical they are, and how persuasive they are. So the readers of Lincoln's speeches, they know something that is beautiful and logical and persuasive when they see it. So, but there has to be an underlying method, and that's what we want to talk about, is the method that made this possible. So the first element is an enunciation, and the enunciation has a given, which is either basic facts or a basic axiom that, that is the foundation for whatever, what the, whatever the issue is that you want to address. And the sought, which is the second part of the enunciation, is, is a general statement of what you want to accomplish. So essentially, the, the enunciation answer, answers the question, why are we here? I get to deal with the facts, yeah. not the legal opinions. <laughs> the exposition uh, takes separately what is given and prepares it in advance for use in the investigation. Now, the real interesting thing about that is, I, I thought that was simple initially. And then after we'd been writing about this kind of stuff for a few years, uh, I realized, I said, investigation, what does that mean? There is no element called investigation. This says, prepares in advance for use in the investigation. In other words, the, the words that show up uh, in the exposition uh, guide you towards investigation, which any scientist would do if they, had a, if they were trying to prove something, right, or persuade. Um, so what, what logic has no force without facts if a six-element proposition is the gun, facts are ammunition. The exposition, and this is, this is the real proof purpose of this, it's, it, it can be the only purpose if the investigation has any meaning. What additional facts are needed to know to investigate, to in order to perform an investigation so that you're gonna have facts that you can use. And what this does is, it lets someone, it, it does a couple things. It lets someone repeat what you are doing if you're the person composing this. So anyone who hears it or reads it can perform the same inv uh, investigation, go through the same elements and see if they come to the same result. And uh, if, if, if you yourself are trying to compose it, it's a formula for you to have maximum credibility. So the third element is the specification. The specification takes separately the thing that is sought and makes clear precisely what it is. In effect, the specification is a hy hypothesis. This is, this is using a term that we is we also use in science where you form a hypothesis and then you, in science you do experiments. Well, as you'll see in, in a proposition, you array the evidence and make an argument. But that's, that's, that's coming up. So the specification essentially answers the question, what must be demonstrated to resolve what is sought?
the construction adds what is lacking in the given. Remember, these are facts. These are, these are brown elements, the earth, foundation. What is, uh, adds what is lacking in the given for finding what is sought. The construction answers the question, how do the facts lead to what is sought? The proof, this is the fifth element, draws the proposed inference by reasoning scientifically from the propositions that have been admitted. So that's read for a reason because heat either warms or it burns and destroys. And so instead of arguing right off the bat, right after you state your conclusion, uh, as far as modern discourse goes, and then jumping into argument, which has not been set up, you wait here till the fifth element and you draw the proposed in, in, inference by reasoning scientifically from admitted propositions and facts. The proof answers the question, how does the admitted truth confirm the proposed inference? The sixth and final element is the conclusion, and the conclusion reverts to the enunciation confirming what has been proved. So essentially the conclusion answers the question, what has been demonstrated? Now these six, these six definitions are Glenn Morrow's translation of what Proclus, a Neoplatonist philosopher, wrote in 480 of the Common Era in his commentaries on Euclid. And if Proclus hadn't recorded these definitions, which had been passed down over the centuries, perhaps we wouldn't be here today because Proclus is the one who provides us, us with the, these definitions. Some of these definitions, uh, believe it or not, are in a very, very few copies of Euclid's elements. There were many, many editions of Euclid's elements in the 19th century. Lincoln read uh, Playfair's Euclid, which does not have these definitions in the preface, but some uh, very few editions of Euclid from other publishers do have them. And so this information was reasonably well available in the 19th century. Euclid's Elements was the second most popular book behind the Bible at that time. So it was a readily available book. So what does it take for a genius to be born? William Herndon described Abraham Lincoln's study of Euclid. Herndon set a scene, uh, Herndon of course, as you all know, was Lincoln's law partner, set a scene of judge and attorneys riding the Illinois Eighth Circuit from courthouse to courthouse four to six months during the spring and fall. Placing a candle on a chair at the head of the bed, he, Lincoln, would read and study for hours. Herndon says, I have known him to study in this position till two o'clock in the morning. Meanwhile, I and others who chanced to occupy the same room would be safely and soundly asleep. On the circuit this way, he studied Euclid until he could with ease demonstrate all the propositions in the six books. How he could maintain his mental equilibrium or concentrate his thoughts on an abstract mathematical proposition while Judge David Davis, Stephen T. Logan, Leonard Sweat, Benjamin Edwards, and I, Herndon, so industriously and volubly filled the air with our interminable snoring was a problem none of us could ever solve. The story is in the words, the message is in the structure. The six elements are a verbal form of the scientific method. Now, an important thing to realize is that plane geometry is not algebra. Plane geometry is words, and when you look at anything that's uh, uh, proved in the, six, uh, in the first six books of Euclid, they're proved with words, and that's why it works. It's words, and it's also the scientific method. The six elements of a proposition put together a demonstration by placing language in structured vessels. 
A six element proposition begins with an enunciation that can, uh, contains a given and a thought. We need to repeat some of this. We don't expect you to absorb it all instantly, but we do have books for sale. <laughs> the given contains basic indisputable facts, a neutral high level statement of what is sought is next. The exposition contains additional facts needed to determine what to investigate. The specification contains the hypothesis to be proved. Uh, Proclus referred to the specification as the proposed inference. Evidentiary facts are arrayed in the construction. It leads into the proof's argument. The proof reasons scientifically to confirm the specification, a conclusion recites what was demonstrated. Now the conclusion is what in today's discourse all broadcasters use to start with and tease you to force you to listen to their conclusions before they restate that the conclusion, he's a liar, she's a liar, this and that, argue, 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 and no, no real result. All the element definitions except the proof directly refer to the given, the sought, or to both the given and sought. When I say refer to, according to Proclus's definitions, or to the enunciation which is composed of the given and the sought. The enunciation anchors synergies among the elements. The enunciation contains a given and sought. The exposition refers to the given. The specification refers to the sought. The construction refers to the given and sought. The proof indirectly refers back to the enunciation. The proposed inference is the specification. Uh, the conclusion reverts to the enunciation. So in the Lincoln-Douglas de de debates, there was, um, in the fourth debate, uh, Stephen A. Douglas questioned the veracity of a statement that Lyman Trumbull had made in a speech, or a speech that Lyman Trumbull had given. And Lincoln uh, defends Trumbull uh, against the personal attack that Douglas made against him. Here's what Lincoln said. Why, sir, there is not a word in Trumbull's speech that depends on Trumbull's veracity at all. He has only arrayed the evidence, which is effectively a construction, and told you what follows as a matter of reasoning, the proof. There is not a statement in the whole speech that depends on Trumbull's word. If you have ever studied geometry, you remember that by a course of reasoning, Euclid proves that all the angles in a triangle are equal to two right angles. Euclid has shown you how to work it out. Now, if you undertake to disprove that proposition, and to show that it is erroneous, would you prove it to be false by calling Euclid a liar? So this is the structure, that the, the, the method that Lincoln used for his, um, I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. OK, thank you. This is the structure that Lincoln used from 1854 on. In our book, Abraham Lincoln and the Structure of Reason, we have 12 of his speeches, 11 letters, and three legal arguments organized in this manner. And I thought, since this is small print, and since you all know the Gettysburg Address, I'd talk about how the Gettysburg Address is organized according to the six elements. Lincoln starts out with a given, with some basic facts. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. So Lincoln, of course, is referring back to one of his favorite documents, the Declaration of Independence. And the thought is testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. So the thought is a test. Can the nation survive? Now, the exposition adds facts to the given. In the given, Lincoln said, now we are engaged in a great civil war. The exposition, we are met on a great battlefield of that war. We're here at Gettysburg on November 19th, 1863 for the dedication. The specification, we have come to dedicate a portion of that field that that nation might live. 
And Lincoln is going to make an argument on what actions are required for the proposition to come true for the nation to survive. And he, he adds to his specification, it is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. So in the construction, he adds essentially the fact that the, the battle that was fought here, the living and dead, have already consecrated this ground. Uh, so we cannot hollow it. They've already, they've already done that. And, the, and then he not so accurately says the world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. This leads to his proof. And in the proof, notice the verbs, because the verbs are the actions that need to be taken. We have to be dedicated to the unfinished work. We have to be dedicated to the great task remaining. We have to take increased devotion. And we have to highly res resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. And this leads into the conclusion that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. So you go from the, the sod, which is a test of can the nation endure, to the specification that we've come to dedicate this field, that that nation might live, and then he makes his argument of what actions are required so that the nation will live and that the nation shall not perish from the earth. So in the process of uh, doing research for Abraham Lincoln and the Structure of Reason, we read every, uh, every book we could on Lincoln's speeches, including the Fred Kaplan book that was given away in the, in the raffle, or that was raffled off, uh, about what, what all the other authors said about Lincoln's speeches. And one book that caught our attention was called The Voice of Lincoln, written by Judge uh, Wanamaker, who was an Ohio Supreme Court Justice. And he wrote a book, this book in 1918, about the um, many speeches of Abraham Lincoln. And in there, he, he, he has these uh, statements. Where did he, Lincoln, get this order which he habitually followed in his discussions on law or government? He does not definitely advise us. Neither do any of his biographers. It is, however, more than passing strange that Lincoln's early acquaintance with and study of the Declaration of Independence brought him directly and intimately in touch with this method of presentation and argument. And that Declaration of Independence is naturally divisible into those same three parts, declaration, demonstration, dedication. It is most natural for us to presume that Lincoln, who studied and quoted the Declaration of Independence more frequently than any other American statements, statesman of his own time or any other should have been strikingly impressed with the logical order so plainly and powerfully put in the Declaration of Independence by his great prototype, Thomas Jefferson. Well, Judge Wanamaker was correct about one thing. Lincoln did love the Declaration of Independence, but he was wrong about saying it had three parts. It actually has six parts. And we'll get to that. Uh, Dumas Malone, Jefferson's uh, major biographer, who wrote a six-volume work about Thomas Jefferson, states that the Declaration has four parts, and he was wrong. <laughs> so when, when I came across this in the voice of Lincoln, David and I kind of got excited, and we said, "Is this? Could Jefferson have used this?" So. I printed out copies of the Declaration, gave a copy to David, and I took a copy, and we each demarcated it, drawing lines between the elements, and we came up with the exact same de uh, demarcation. So let's take a look, and this is kind of an eye test, but I'm just going to point out some highlights. This is the, 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 an abstract of some of the major statements in the Declaration. And in the given, Jefferson talks about the laws of nature and of nature's God. The sought is they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. So the sought is essentially to separate. And then in the exposition, he talks about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So he's kind of expanding on the laws of nature and nature's God. Then he moves to the specification where he's, 
He ends up saying, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. So he goes from the general thought of separation to the more precise specification, separation now. Now is the time. Now, the, this is one of my favorite elements, the construction and the declaration. Jefferson says, to prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. Well, the, the construction is arraying the evidence. And so the facts that Jefferson presents are a list of complaints against King George. Those are his facts. This leads into the proof where Jefferson argues the actions that have been taken against King George that haven't worked. So again, you focus on the verbs. In the Gettysburg Address, Lincoln argues what actions need to be taken for the nation to survive. In the Declaration, Jefferson argues what actions have been taken that haven't worked. And, and this leads to his conclusion that these colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. So in, in the last, over the last five years, David and I have been reviewing the 19,000 letters of Thomas Jefferson, and we've identified over 700 instances where Jefferson used this Euclidean structure to make persuasive arguments, including the uh, Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, which Jefferson writes about in his uh, autobiography. He says that he had to write this legal statute as a proposition. Those are his words. And it's not standard to put an argument into a legal statute. So, so by looking at all these Jefferson propositions, we can tell a story of American history through the arguments of Thomas Jefferson. So we're, we're fully engaged in that project. So in August 1862, uh, Timothy Pickering, uh, received a letter from John Adams where Adams explained his maneuver that resulted in Jefferson drafting the Declaration of Independence. And these are like two little kids talking to each other, sort of. <laughs> so Adams wrote, Jefferson proposed to me to make the draft. Adams said, I will not. Jefferson, you should do it. Adams, oh no. <laughs> Jefferson, why will you not? You ought to do it. Adams, I will not. <laughs> Jefferson, why? Adams, reason, reasons enough. Jefferson, what can be your reasons? Adams, reason first. You are a Virginian, and a Virginian ought to appear at the head of this business. Reason second, I am obnoxious, suspected, and unpopular. You are very much otherwise, reason third. You can write 10 times better than I can. And of course, Jefferson had a method for writing, just as Lincoln did. So there are some guidelines that we've developed in, in the process of analyzing Lincoln's and Jefferson's propositions. And some of the guidelines, these are just some of the guidelines. It's important that the facts and the given be basic and indisputable. Now the facts and the given can be either facts or they can be basic axioms. In the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson presents some basic axioms. And that can serve as a basic fact on which you ground your proposition. Uh, facts are more important than logic because without facts, there is nothing upon log which rog logic can rest. The given should recite the basic, obvious, indisputable uh, facts that will build. Facts are established truth. We have to understand the difference between a fact and an opinion. And I'm not going to digress on that point, but that's, that's important. If the facts of an unfinished writing are weak, the, then you need to consider adjusting either the sought or the specification. The, the, basic, the best facts are sometimes admissions from the other side. And our book talks extensively about the Cooper Union speech where Lincoln uh, talked about what uh, Stephen A. Douglas said, and he used that as a basis for his first proposition in the Cooper Union speech. You can read the book to learn more about that. Uh, credibility is so important. Foundational fact grows credibility. Credibility by itself proves nothing. 
a provable specification or hypothesis is essential. Uh, and because if you have a, a, a believable hypothesis, this will permit a perhaps skeptical audience to make room for the possibility that your proposition is correct. And you bring them along as you work your way through the elements. And of course, it's important to check that the, the sought is more general and more neutral than the spe specification. Uh, and the sought generally should appear impartial because you're just raising a general issue that everyone will agree is an issue. It occurred to me as Dan was talking about Judge Wanamaker and Dumas Malone, we never criticize living authors. <laughs> that way we stay alive longer. <laughs> you can't criticize you. Yeah. No, us you have no, no bar on, no bar. Uh, the exposition recites additional facts necessary to conduct the investigation. That's about the fourth time we've said that. Uh, the facts should be unquestionable. And the war came is in the second inaugural's exposition. Uh, you see the similarity between it and we are met on a great battlefield of that war. That's the exposition from the Gettysburg Address that Dan presented. Uh, there's a lawyer in Washington, D.C., a really good lawyer, Pat Malone, I don't think he's related to Dumas Malone, but he, I'm certainly uh, not going to criticize him except for one little thing that I have to criticize him for or I'd lose all my credibility. He uh, wrote in a, I believe it was the litigation um, uh, monthly or quarterly publication of the American Bar Association about the second inaugural, and he focused in on uh, the statement, and the war came. And he talked about how beautiful it is, which it is, how restrained and controlled it is, and that's true. And then he talked about the genius of Abraham Lincoln, and that far into that sentence is certainly true, but it, what the genius was, said Malone, that he didn't sizzle, he didn't get mad. He, this isn't a quote, but this is the gist of it. Uh, he, he restrained himself uh, from saying, and the war came despite all the bad faith and the horrible deeds of the South. He didn't say anything of that. Well, that took absolutely no restraint on Lincoln's part. Why? because of the purpose of the exposition. He was just following Proclus's definition as to what you do in an exposition. And th that is why this is a credible way to do things. This is an honest way to do things. And the way we're doing it now uh, makes no sense. Do the given and to some degree the specification err on the side of understatement? Obvious truth sometimes seems like understatement. Is the construction largely fact-based? The construction arrays facts that lead to the proof. It is the equivalence, any lawyers in the room, how many? Oh, every, okay, there are always a few in every Civil War round table. Uh, that's, that's the equivalent of marshalling evidence uh, in a legal case in a jury. Uh, it's one of the most important jury instructions. So always when you're trying a case, uh, you're, you're trying to settle a dispute and the judge is forcing you to uh, use evidence that's reasonable. Uh, admit, uh, you know, if it's hearsay, it's probably unless it falls into an exception, it's not going to be admitted. <laughs>
Uh, construction can be innovative but, need, innovative, but need not be. It can be simple or complex. It can be short or long. It should be largely fact-based. It must be clear and understandable to smoothly lead into the proof. So another important check is that do the SOT specification and conclusion align. And this, choke, this checks the focus and development. And uh, the SOT is a high, high level, fairly neutral statement. The specification is a clear statement of the hypothesis. And the conclusion is a firm, clear statement of what we, was demonstrated. And we saw how these aligned in the Gettysburg Address and in the Declaration of Independence. And they usually progress in forcefulness from general to specific to firm. So in the Gettysburg Address, the general was a test, can the nation survive? The specific, we've come to dedicate this field that the nation may survive. And the firm conclusion that this nation shall not perish from the earth. And there is room for measured artful expression within a con conclusion's defined purpose. And we see that with, with Abraham Lincoln clearly in the Gettysburg Address. Uh, is the proof consistent with the SOT specification and conclusion? The argument must line up with the logical direction that you've provided through these three green elements. And if it doesn't, something needs to be, uh, something needs to be modified. Either you need to work on your proof or you need to change your SOT and specification. Are the construction proof and conclusion strong yet free of overstatement? The construction should not be argumentative. And in the declaration, uh, uh, the construction gets close, but doesn't really uh, cross the line. The proof scientific reasoning should be on point. The conclusion should clearly state what is demonstrated. Attorney Isaac Newton Arnold described the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And this kind of goes back to the SMSG point. I know it when I see it. And the Potter Stewart quote. Arnold contrasted Stephen A. Douglas, an Aristotelian do-whatever-works rhetorician, with Abraham Lincoln, a student of geometric structured logic. Douglas carried away the most popular applause, but Lincoln made the deeper and more lasting impression. Douglas did not disdain an immediate ad captendum triumph, while Lincoln aimed at permanent conviction. Sometimes, when Lincoln's friends urged him to raise a storm of applause, which he could always do by his happy illustrations and amusing stories, he refused, saying, the occasion was too serious, the issue too grave. I do not seek applause, said he, nor to amuse the people. I want to convince them. It was often observed during this canvas that while Douglas was sometimes greeted with the loudest cheers, when Lincoln closed, the people seemed serious, solemn and serious, and could be heard all the way through the crowd, gravely and anxiously discussing the topics on which he had been speaking. So what, what you're witnessing in there, and, and you know, forgive us for these quotations, but this is, this is what his contemporaries said. And this is what goes to prove the truth of what we have rediscovered. They felt the iron logic of Lincoln when they heard it. And they were convinced in a reasonable, truthful way. Language is expression. Structure is place. Language offers a system for using words. Structure offers a system for using language. That is the solution. It's what our, our country needed during the Civil War, and it's what we need, no matter what your political uh, persuasion is. It's what we need today. Uh, the six elements, six element instrument 
So the communication of Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln teach this. Their six element writings are candles along a road that spotlight a rational structural solution. It is a language of science for human issues. And we want to close with a human issue. Abraham Lincoln on February 11th, 1861, gave a farewell speech in, get, in uh, Springfield as he was getting on the train to go to Washington to be inaugurated as our 16th president. And this is his 152-word uh, farewell address, and it demarcates. Lincoln could even say goodbye in the form of a Euclidean proposition. So he starts out, my friends, no one in my situation can appreciate my feeling of sadness at this. So the given is that he's sad at this parting. So the, the sought is to say farewell. The exposition um, expands on the given. He gives three reasons, three facts as to why he's sad. To this place and the kindness of these people, I owe everything. Two, here I have lived a quarter of a century and have passed from a young to an old man. And thirdly, here my children have been born and one is buried. And now the specification. I now leave not knowing when or whether ever I may return. So he goes from a farewell to an uncertain farewell. Now, one of my favorite elements, along with Thomas Jefferson's construction, this is Lincoln's construction, with a task before me greater than that which rested upon Washington. You have room for very artful language with this system, link with this method. Lincoln didn't have to list the, the facts as to why the um, things were so uncertain. He didn't have to say some states have left the Union, others are threatening to leave, Fort Sumter's, you know, being threatened. His audience knew those facts, so this allowed him to be very artful in what he says in his construction. And then he gets to his proof. Without one, without the assistance of that divine being, whoever attended him, I cannot succeed. With that assistance, I cannot fail. Trusting in him who can go with me and remain with you and be everywhere for good, let us confidently hope that all will yet be well. So he argues what's required for a successful journey, a successful presidency. In his conclusion, to his care commending you, as I hope in your prayers you will commend me, I bid you an affectionate farewell. So he builds on the argument and the proof to, to conclude with I hope in your prayers you will commend me. And he closes with an affectionate farewell. So we go from a farewell to an uncertain farewell to an affectionate farewell. So Abraham Lincoln gets on the train, goes to Washington, is inaugurated as our 16th president, goes on to give his great speeches, his first inaugural, Gettysburg Address, second inaugural. You all know what they said, and now you know how they were structured. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to take this with me. Do we have any questions? Okay. Uh, I need this, but uh, do people, there are a lot of people who instinctively know how to do this. Are there, I mean, there are people who have never studied Euclid, never taken a debate class in school, and never, who are, can really sort of do this without knowing about Euclid, right? You know, okay. people have different abilities. Uh, different levels of their own honesty, uh, different levels of their own knowledge, uh, and may tend themselves to be more logical or less logical than other people. But you cannot do this accidentally. And if this seemed complicated at times, and we were going way too fast, I know, for you to absorb a lot of this, our hope, though, was that you absorb the main points and the importance of this kind of system. You absolutely cannot do it by accident. Um, now, I can think of one instance where someone did it where I know they didn't know this system and they had circulated a draft of a short motion on a, a, a legal listserv that I belonged to and it demarcated perfectly, and it was a great motion. There were a few little uh, vagaries and 
things that need to be cleaned up just from a pure English standpoint. So I, I redrafted it, but didn't change the structure a bit, and sent it back to him. And I said, that's the best motion I've ever seen, <laughs> according to what you were asking for. So it worked once. I, I mean, I understand it's consistent, but you could never do this. I think, I think even once is unusual to do this accidentally. And you know, that's the, that's the hardest battle we've had to fight. Well, Lincoln was instinctively logical. Well, you know, everybody, he said he learned Euclid so as to learn how to demonstrate. And every, most people know that plain geometry is nothing other than pure logic. But, but if you don't have those Proclus definitions, you're lost. And how Lincoln rediscovered this for himself, you know, Jefferson, Jefferson had, was one of the best, certainly the best educated uh, person in the United States at the time. There was no one more educated than him, and one of the better educated in the world. And probably he was taught this directly. Lincoln couldn't have been taught it directly. He had less than one year of formal education. He figured it out. And just imagine the joy he must have felt when he discovered, and I'm confident, though I certainly don't know it, that he at one point discovered that that declaration demarcates. Uh, any other questions? Oh. Okay. I was going to say. Did you by chance look at George Whip who taught Jefferson and his writing? Was he following that same line? Well, the, the answer is we tried to find the curriculum at William and Mary that was followed by George Wythe or other professors, and we haven't been able to find anything definitive yet. But your question is a valid question, and, and we'll continue looking at it. One question back here. Thank you. Very erudite discussion. Um, is there anything that you would, in your analysis of the Emancipation Proclamation, uh, actually, this type of uh, lie? Actually, I, I have the Emancipation Proclamation on my tie, and the Emancipation, the, the, the answer is no, because the Emancipation Proclamation is not really an argument, it's a statement. And when you make a statement, you, you don't use a stu structure, it's when you make an argument. Thank you very much. Thank you. And don't leave, we've got some uh, things to present you with. I'll give Dan. Oh, I'm going to thank read you. from David's. Dan and David are both getting our certificate of honor by order of the general staff of the Civil Roundtable of Milwaukee. This is reported to either David or Dan for fulfilling our understand. For, for, excuse me, for furthering our understanding of the causes and consequences of the American Civil War, the watershed event in our nation's history. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, thank you very, very much. much. Thank you. Thank you.